I built this guitar with my buddy Grant Batson, who you might have seen in some of my older videos on the channel. And Grant was a full-time guitar maker in a previous life, and I consider him to be a true artist with just an incredible creative vision. And he came prepared for this build with some tools, some wood, and a one-to-one -one scale drawing of an original electric guitar design he'd come up with. After some brainstorming, we got to work by milling up the Wingay boards Grant had brought so that we could glue them up to form the body and neck blank. Before gluing the pieces together, we transferred the body shape onto the pieces and cut one of the pieces roughly in half at the bandsaw so that we could use these pieces on each side of the body. And Wingay is pretty darn expensive and we wanted to be able to use the material we had as efficiently as possible. With that done, we could get the body and neck blank glued up, and in case you're wondering, this is going to be a neck through guitar, meaning the body and neck were all glued up as one solid blank, with the piece for the neck running through the center of the guitar body. While the glue dried on the body, I traced the design in Illustrator and then ran a test cut of the body and neck profile on a scrap piece of plywood. Unfortunately, my X-Carve CNC isn't quite long enough to cut the entire profile of the entire neck, but we could at least get the first half cut to shape to give us a reference point. After taking the blank out of the clamps, we laid out our template on the body to make sure it would fit within our blank, and then we marked out the center line of the guitar, which is a pretty critical location when building a guitar, as most things will be laid out based on this center line. We ran the blank through the planer quickly to flush up the pieces, and then we could cut the body and neck shape, as well as the pickup cavity, into the blank using the X-Carve. After cutting the outline for the body, we also cut one of the wings, as we called them, which will be attached to the main body using copper pipe. Next, we swapped over to a core box bit to cut away a recessed area on the surface of the body, which both created a kind of contoured area where the fretboard meets the body, but also helped to raise the bridge height over the body, which increases the break angle of the strings over the saddles. In retrospect, we cut this recess a little bit too deep, which caused us some problems later on, but we'll get to that in a bit. With that, the body and one of the wings was shaped, and next we could work on the other wing, which we decided to make from epoxy. I 3D printed a mold for the epoxy, again using that vector shape I had created from Grant's drawing, and then we needed to drill some holes for the copper pipe, which we needed to cast into the epoxy. And these holes needed to be a fairly precise size so the epoxy wouldn't leak around them, so rather than model them into the print, we created a quick drilling jig, which we were actually able to use later to drill the holes for the pipe in the sides of the main body. After drilling the holes, we got the copper pipe placed in the mold, using the drilling jig to help keep the pipes running parallel, and then we sealed around the holes with some silicone sealant. For the epoxy, I used Total Boat's thick set epoxy and went with a two layer pour so that we could have one layer with copper pigment and one clear layer. And I was actually able to use the 3D model to figure out the volume of epoxy I'd need for each pour, and I added some of this black diamond copper pigment on the first pour to keep with that kind of copper theme we went with on this build. A few hours later, once the first layer had a chance to set up a bit, we poured the second clear layer, and my camera decided to take a dive at this point. After reframing the shot, I continued the pour, and you can see how this two-layer pour really sets off the copper pipe, and I personally love the final look. The next thing to work on was the fretboard, and we again turned to the CNC for this. I installed a 1 32nd of an inch bit to cut the fret slots, and started by once again running a test cut on a piece of plywood. Unfortunately, we didn't realize until we went to install the frets later that you actually need to use a 23 thousandth of an inch bit for standard fret slots, so our slots ended up being slightly too wide, but we were able to make them work. Anyway, while the test cut ran, we milled a fretboard blank down to thickness and also milled down a piece of thin maple that was roughly the same length and width. And this thin piece would act as an accent strip to give a subtle bit of contrast between the neck and fretboard, which are both made of wingy. We glued this piece to the back face of the fretboard blank, and then once the glue dried, we could cut the fret slots and fretboard shape into the blank at the CNC. Next, we needed to radius the fretboard, and the exact radius you go with is really up to your personal taste. Generally speaking, the flatter the fretboard radius, the better the guitar will be for playing lead, and conversely, the rounder the radius, the easier the guitar will be for playing chords. Grant had created a jig for cutting a fretboard radius with a router years ago, so that's what we used. But there are lots of methods for cutting a radius like this, including just sanding it in with a curved sanding block. We also could have done this on the CNC had I known how to program it, but this lower tech method only required a little bit of cleanup sanding and we were left with a perfectly radius fretboard. With the fretboard shaped, we could move back to the body and neck and continue refining the shape, starting with removing the bulk of the material from the neck and headstock where the CNC couldn't reach. <laughs> 
Next, we could refine the curves on the side of the body a bit, and Grant is a big fan of Sanders since he works with a lot of curves in his work. After working at the belt grinder, Grant then further refined the shape with the oscillating belt sander. To further add to that brake angle at the saddle, Grant wanted to add a back set to the neck, similar to what Gibson guitars achieve with their angled neck pocket. And this was a bit of a tricky thing for us to work out how to cut though, because our neck was already part of our guitar body. And we definitely could have rigged this up on the CNC, but we decided to try using a planer sled instead, as the planer removes material much more quickly. We centered the guitar on my planer sled and hot glued it in place, and then we could pass the whole thing through the planer to remove the material from the face of the neck. We added a guide rail to the edge of the planer bed to help keep the guitar square to the planer lengthwise, and we also marked a stopping point near the headstock so that we'd know when we'd removed enough material. Once we got close, we moved over to the drum sander to really smooth things out, and after a handful of passes at each machine, we were left with a pretty much perfect backset angle on the neck. Next, we could continue shaping the neck, moving on to the headstock, which needed a lot of material removed, including an even steeper angle cut onto its face and back. We also cut away a ton of the bulk from the back side of the neck to get it closer to its final thickness, and we made most of the cut using the bandsaw but had to finish the cut with a handsaw. Before shaping the profile of the headstock, we first needed to create the headstock veneer, which would kind of act as a template for the shape of the headstock itself. We first cut off a thin layer of wingae from one of the wings on the guitar, and then Grant traced out the headstock shape he had come up with onto the piece. We then glued on another maple backer piece to match the fretboard, rough cut the shape of the bandsaw, and then finally, back to his old standby, the sander, Grant refined the shape of the veneer, and then we could test fit it on the headstock. To give this guitar a little branding, I combined our two logos, putting my axe into Grant's initials, and then I engraved this logo into the veneer using a 132nd of an inch bit on the CNC. After the X-Carve was done, I filled the area with more copper epoxy, using Total Boat's high performance this time so that it cured a little bit more quickly, and then after the epoxy cured overnight, we could sand it flush at the drum sander. Finally, we wiped on a little bit of mineral spirits just to simulate a finish, and while it's pretty subtle, I really like the look we ended up with here. Next, we needed to get a truss rod slot routed into the neck, and after considering a few options, we decided to just remount the body on the CNC, since we didn't have much of a reference surface for a router. After routing the slot, I tested the fit and needed to route a little bit larger of an area where the adjustment mechanism on the end of the truss rod was, and after expanding that area, the truss rod fit nice and snug. Before gluing on the fretboard, Grant cleaned up the face of the headstock a little bit more, and then we could test fit the fretboard nut and the veneer. And as you can see, one other big advantage of using this kind of headstock veneer is the negative space between the veneer and the fretboard automatically creates a slot for the nut so you don't have to cut one in manually. With that done, we could move on to the fairly daunting task of gluing on the fretboard. The reason it's kind of daunting is if the fretboard slips around during the glue up, it could throw off the ability for the guitar to be intonated properly later, so it's extremely important to get this right. Grant, of course, had an awesome trick for this. We held the fretboard in place and drilled a tiny locating hole through two of the slots on the fretboard into the neck, and we could put a small brad nail into these holes for positioning during the glue up. Before gluing on the fretboard, we needed to add the truss rod, and Grant always adds some silicone when doing this just to keep the truss rod from moving around and rattling later. We also added a small cap to the truss rod slot to keep excess wood glue from causing issues with the truss rod's functionality. I flushed the strip up with the face of the neck with my block plane, and then we could get the fretboard glued in place, adding those locating nails before adding the clamps. While the glue dried, Grant worked on some of the hardware pieces he had <laughs> dreamed up, including some custom volume knobs made from wingay and copper pipe, a wingay veneered pickup cover, and a wraparound tailpiece made from, you guessed it, more copper pipe. And those little hooks that you see protruding from the tailpiece, which the guitar strings will hook around, yeah, those are made from Romex copper wire. Pretty cool. Anyway, after the glue dried on the fretboard, we demolded the epoxy wing and cut the copper pipe down closer to its final length, and then we could lay everything in place and get a good idea of how the guitar was going to look in its final form, and needless to say, we were getting pretty excited. Next, we could continue with more shaping, starting by sanding down those little ridges left on the face of the guitar by the core box bit, and then we could move on to some neck shaping. 
This and the fretboard were the two parts of this project which intimidated me the most, but luckily Grant has shaped his fair share of guitar necks in his lifetime and he walked me through the process. We started by marking out the locations of the first and tenth frets on the back of the neck, and then we use this neck profile template to establish the shape and depth of the neck profile at those locations. After establishing those two points on the neck, we transferred the profile shape onto a piece of paper and then did some quick layout work to determine the exact location of the first facet we'd be cutting in on the neck. And essentially removing this facet knocks off the bulk of the material from the neck profile and gives us a good concrete measurement that we can work from. We could then transfer those measurements to the neck, again referencing that ever important center line, and I marked lines on the back as well as the sides of the neck, matching those measurements we had come up with using the template. Once those layout lines were marked, we used a rasp to create a flat spot at each end of the neck, connecting those two layout lines diagonally, and then I could use a spoke shave to remove all of the material between those two areas, working my way back towards the lines that we had marked out. And as you can see, my goal here was to remove the material between the two lines I'd marked on each side of the neck, staying as straight as possible along the length of the neck. When I started getting down close to final depth, I started to run into the excess material we still had where the neck transitioned to the body and the headstock. To remove this material, we pulled out one of the ultimate in-stock removal tools, an angle grinder with a turbo plane attached. And Grant had never used one of these before, but he took to it immediately, and he started refining those sections on the neck, blending that transition from the neck to the body, and starting to shape a little volute where the neck met the headstock. Once those areas were cleaned up a bit, we could move back to more neck shaping, getting that profile down closer and closer to the template, and really starting to refine the curves. We also moved from using a spoke shave to a rasp at this point, as the rasp also acted as a straight edge to help ensure we had a nice flat profile along the entire length of the neck. And really, this is all based on feel and personal preference, and because of that, it's important that you continue checking the feel of the neck as you're shaping. Once we were satisfied we were close to the final shape, we could continue with the build, working on attaching the headstock veneer next. Once again, locating this piece without it slipping during the glue up is pretty critical so that that nut slot ends up in the right spot. So we created a little clamping call out of a scrap piece of plywood, which would not only help to create even clamping pressure, but would help to keep the veneer in place. To create the locating holes on the headstock, we set the veneer in place with the nut between it and the fretboard, and pre-drilled two locating holes, and then almost went ahead with the glue up, but thankfully remembered we needed to cut the access hole for the truss rod first. We did this by drilling a hole with a Forstner bit, cutting parallel lines with a handsaw, and then cleaning things up with a rasp. Okay. Finally, we could glue everything up, first adding the headstock veneer, then adding a piece of painter's tape to keep any glue squeeze out from gluing the call to the veneer, then finally adding the screws through the call and the veneer to clamp everything down. We also added a few more clamps just for good measure. Once the glue dried, we could work on the side dot markers, which we made from more of that Romex wire, and we pre-drilled holes for these, drove in the pieces of Romex, and then sanded them flush, and I personally think these look awesome. Next, Grant wanted to flush up the headstock with the headstock veneer at the oscillating belt sander, but he was complaining about it being a little too high to use comfortably on this flip top stand. So I pulled out my Harbor Freight hydraulic cart, which is a super handy tool to have around the shop, and created a customized platform for Grant to stand on, making sure to get the height just right for him. Nice and ergonomic. Anyway, Grant got the headstock shaped quickly, and then worked on getting a bone nut shaped as well, also locating where the slots needed to be cut into the nut. Unfortunately, Grant didn't bring his nut slotting files with him, so these were just kind of placeholders, but it at least made the guitar functional. Next, we worked on getting the two wings shaped, starting by sanding the epoxy wing down to thickness at the drum sander. The control cavity for all the electronics would be located in the other wing, so we went ahead and cut a pocket into the back side of this wing with a ledge for a cover plate to rest on. Using the same drilling jig from when we created the epoxy wing, we could then drill holes into the side of the wing gate wing for the copper pipes, which again attach the wings to the body. For the control cavity cover plate, I decided to continue with the copper epoxy theme, and I 3D printed another mold and then poured a thin layer of high performance epoxy and let it cure overnight. Unfortunately, this was still a little bit too thick for this epoxy, and the piece warped a little bit due to heat, but I was able to sand it down to the drum sander and still ended up with the piece thick enough for the cover plate. I cut the shape of the plate as well as a few holes for magnets at the CNC, and then after confirming the fit, Grant glued the magnets, which hold the cover plate in place, into the wing as well as the cover plate. 
He also went ahead and permanently installed the copper pipe into the wing using some CA glue and then pinning the pipe in place with more Romex. Finally, he drilled a hole for the output jack, which will also live in this wing. Next, Grant continued shaping the neck joint with the turboplane, getting it close to its final shape, and then I could come back and refine all those curves with lots and lots of sanding. The next step was adding the frets to the neck. The first thing to do when adding frets is to add a radius to the fret wire so that it more closely matches the radius on the fretboard. To do this, you typically use a fret wire bending tool like this one. After bending, Grant snipped off the very ends of the fret wire, which don't get bent as effectively due to the design of these types of fret benders. To install the frets, you typically need to apply a good amount of pressure to seat the fret into the fret slot, but as I mentioned, we accidentally used an oversized bit to cut these slots, so our frets fit into the slots a little bit loosely. To help keep the frets in place, we added a little wood glue to the slots before adding the frets. We cut the frets to length with a fret nipper, and then to keep the frets in place while the glue dried, we used some of these Rockler Mandy clamps, which worked perfectly for this. And you'll also see that we added some painter's tape to help keep the frets from slipping around when we added the clamps. Because of the clamps, we could only add every other fret on this first run, and after the glue set up on the first round of frets, I repeated the process on the rest of the frets. While the glue dried on the frets, we continued working on the other odds and ends, working on the truss rod cover next. Grant drew out a rough shape for this cover on a scrap piece of wingay, rough cut it at the bandsaw, and then shaped it over the oscillating belt sander. After shaping, we clamped it in place, drilled a mounting hole, countersunk the hole, and then drove in a little copper-plated screw that I just happened to have left over from a previous project, which matched up perfectly with this build. Next, we could get holes drilled into the sides of the body so that we can mount the wings, and I marked out hole locations on the face of the body and then added the drilling template we had used previously, taping it in place with some painter's tape. Next, I rigged up the guitar so that we could drill the holes of the drill press, and I used a few pieces of plywood to create a more stable foot to hold the guitar square to the drill bit. After drilling the holes, we figured out how long the copper pipe actually needed to be, which was quite a bit shorter, and we cut it to length with a tubing cutter before driving the piece into place. Before mounting the other wing, Grant went ahead and got the wiring soldered to the volume and tone pots, and then he added some copper shielding tape to the inside of the control cavity before installing the pots along with the input jack. With that done, we could drill the hole through the body to the pickup cavity so that we could run the pickup wire to the control cavity. And this wire actually runs through the copper tubing, which is part of the reason we use tubing as the standoffs here, and so we needed to drill this hole through the inside wall of one of the holes in the side of the body. Also, I thought this was a pretty clever technique from Grant, adding a piece of copper pipe over the drill bit while drilling to keep the bit from damaging the wall of the guitar body. We drilled another hole through the surface of the pickup cavity to connect to the through hole, and once we confirmed the pickup wire would feed through easily, we could work on locating the bridge. And this was another slightly stressful step, as it's critical that the bridge be located centered along the center line of the guitar, as well as the correct distance from the nut so that it matches the scale length of the guitar. And again, if this placement is off, it can throw off the intonation of the guitar, so we really took our time with this. Once the bridge was fit, we could go ahead and get the second wing added to the guitar, and we also ran a spare guitar string through the pickup wire hole so that we could use it as a fish tape later when running the pickup wire. When we were trying to clamp the second wing against the epoxy wing, we realized that we hadn't actually secured that first wing in place yet, and it was moving around on us. To secure it in place permanently, we removed the wing, added a little bit of CA glue to the copper pipe, and then pinned the pipe in place from the back side of the guitar, again using more of that Romex wire. And this gave us a surprisingly secure fit, and these little copper dots match the side dots and really tie in nicely with the rest of the guitar. We repeated the same process for the second wing, once again gluing and pinning it in place, and the guitar body was really starting to take shape. Next, we could work on dressing the frets. I started by using fret nippers to trim the fret wire flush with the edges of the fretboard as they were overhanging. After trimming the frets flush, we worked up a little filing jig, which was just a scrap piece of wood with a 15 degree slot cut into it at the table saw, and the slot fit one of my metal files. And we ran this jig along the edge of the fretboard, and this beveled the edges of the frets, making them more comfortable when your hand runs along the length of the neck. To level the frets, we added a piece of sandpaper to the edge of a board we flattened at the jointer, and then we ran this along the length of the frets until they were all on the same plane. And this is extremely important as any frets that are out of level can cause a lot of buzzing later on. 
Luckily, since our fretboard was pretty darn flat, we didn't have much leveling to do. And next, Grant worked on crowning the frets, which removes the flat portion that's created on the top of the frets during leveling. He also rounded the ends of the frets, which again makes them more comfortable when playing. We left a full fret polishing for later as we wanted to get this guitar strung up for a quick test before Grant had to end his trip here to Asheville, and so we moved back to getting the hardware installed, adding those knobs that Grant had made earlier. Next, I temporarily installed the tuners so that we could get the wraparound tailpiece located and installed, and this positioning was pretty simple once we added the high and low E strings, and we really just needed to make sure the strings ran across the saddles in the right spots. Next, we could get the pickup wire fed through and get the pickup mounted, and we realized that, again, due to cutting away too much material from the face of the guitar, we'd have to mount the pickup so high that the wiring would be visible, which just really wouldn't look very good. To make this look a little nicer, we cut a pickup ring from a scrap piece of wingay, and then Grant shaped it off camera, and it just mounts around the pickup magnetically. Finally, we could solder the pickup wires to the pots, and once that was done, we could try out the guitar for the first time, but you're gonna have to wait to hear it in all its glory until the end of the video. So as I mentioned, we got the guitar playable right before Grant had to head home, and I was left with the task of taking the guitar back apart for finishing and final setup. To assist with this disassembly process, I decided to try out this awesome new tool from Fantic, one of the sponsors of today's video. And this electric screwdriver, dubbed the NEX L1 Pro, has some really cool features, including six different torque settings to help you avoid stripping or snapping some of the more fragile fasteners. The torque is easily changed with the push of a button and confirmed with the built-in LED screen, which also shows you the drill direction and the remaining battery life. The chuck, which they call the shark chuck, makes it super simple to install and remove the included bits single-handedly, and its tiny size allows you to get into tight spots easily. This tool just launched on Indiegogo and has already crushed its funding goal, and I can see why as it comes in at a killer value at 49 bucks. So if you'd like to learn more about this really handy tool, check out the link in the video description below. Anyway, after disassembling the guitar, I gave everything another good sanding, making sure to hit any spots that got dinged during the assembly process, and then it was time for finish. So I knew I wanted a matte finish on this build as I personally much prefer a matte finish to a super glossy finish, especially on a guitar neck, and I also needed a finish that would play nicely with the epoxy portions of the guitar. After considering a few options, I decided to go with Rubio Monocoat, which I've had a lot of luck with in the past on epoxy and wood projects. Rubio is super simple to apply, I just mixed the oil with the accelerator, wiped it on, and let it react with the wood for a few minutes before wiping off the excess, and I was left with a beautiful matte look that felt great in the hand. Once the finish had a chance to dry, I oiled up the fretboard and then I could get the guitar reassembled, once again using that NEX L1 Pro, as well as a little string winder adapter that I 3D printed, which really helps speed up restringing. Next, I needed to work on the guitar setup, which is really an art form in and of itself, but I'll touch on the main points here. First, I needed to adjust the truss rod to flatten out the neck and help with the action. Next, the nut slots needed to be filed to the correct depth, which I did with some slotting files I picked up. And finally, I adjusted the bridge height to help set the action, and then adjusted the saddles so the guitar had the correct intonation. With that, all that was left to do was to make sure I was in tune, and then I could try the guitar out in all of its final glory. Alright, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. I am super, super pumped with the way this guitar came together. Grant and I are actually going to be raffling off this guitar and all of the proceeds are going to be going to charity. So if you guys want to learn more about that, check out the link in the video description below. I also want to say a huge shout out to my YouTube members. I am super, super appreciative for their support. I'll have a list of all my members here on the screen. If you guys want to learn more about that, you can check out a link to that somewhere here on the screen or in the video description below. So if you guys aren't already subscribers, why not go ahead and get subscribed and ring that little notification bell so you don't miss my future videos. And last, while you're here, why not go ahead and check out this video of mine that YouTube thinks you'll enjoy. All right, thanks for watching, everybody, and until next week, happy building.